Welcome to week four of our message series called Cross Training. In this series, we've been unpacking the idea of what it means to be a follower of Jesus. And we've made it very clear that you cannot follow Jesus without a cross. There's going to be times when following Jesus gets really hard in your life, but it is going to be worth it in the end. We've seen that being a sinner does not disqualify you from following Jesus. In fact, it's a prerequisite. We all need to be humble enough to admit that we have a sin problem and we need to admit that we cannot save ourselves. We looked at some benefits of following Jesus, and we noted that one major benefit is that whatever fo whenever followers of Jesus find themselves in very difficult circumstances, they can refuse to let fear take hold of them. Jesus has promised to never leave us or forsake us, so we are never alone when we face major challenges in life. Now today we're going to look at a different question. The question is this, what should followers of Jesus wear? So did you realize that you can often tell who someone is following by what they wear? I'm going to give you a quick quiz. I'm going to let you grade your own quiz, so be honest. I'm going to show you some pictures, and you can tell me who these people are following just based on how they're dressed. First picture. All right, you guys got it? One wrong. All right, next picture. Who are these guys following? No, that would be the Detroit Lions. All right, third group. No. No. With this group, it's kind of interesting. Nobody's real clear on who they follow. They're, it appears they're lost or confused. Anthropologists have studied this people group for years, and they really can't figure out who they follow. It has something to do with cheese, but that's all we know at this point. All right, now here's a harder one that I think you might get wrong. What's this next one? Do you know this one? Anybody. I threw one in here that I didn't think anybody would get right. Oregon, no. First of all, what sport is it? Oh, we got, yeah, you'll know. Yeah. That's the Brazil soccer team, okay? So I bet only one person got that right. Good job over here. All right, now let's switch to world religions. Based on this, who do they follow? Yes, you are right. All right, this next picture, who do they follow? No. Yeah, right. Yeah. Be Beyond the GPS, who do they follow? Anybody know? Hey, this is the Sikh religion. S-I-K-H. It's actually the fifth largest religion in the world. Okay. But they dress kind of cool. All right, so now, before we look at the next one, let's figure out what would Christians wear if people are going to identify you're a Christian. Here's option number one. What do you think? Brian? Brian? Yeah. You know, you, you shouldn't be ashamed of your faith, right? So you should be willing to wear this to work tomorrow? Brian, you want to try it? I'll buy the shirt and the hair if you, if you wear it. No. <laughs> no. All right, that's option one. What about option two? What about this group? Do you want to just run and then join that group? They claim to be Christians. They claim to be Christians. God hates you. You're going to hell. Come join us. Wow. I don't think I want to join that group. So today, I want to look at a key scripture from John's Gospel. Jesus has gathered his close followers together, and he tells them, I'm about to leave, and where I'm going, you can't follow. How would you have felt if you were one of his followers? You followed Jesus now for three years, and now he tells you he's going to be leaving, but you can't follow him. And they probably want to know where he's going, but Jesus changes the subject because he wants them to focus in on the main thing of all the main things that he wants them to remember. John 13, verse 34, A new command I give you, love one another. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. By this, everyone will know you are my disciples if you love one another. 
So Jesus says, a new command I give you, love one another. Your first response might be, that doesn't sound like a new command, because I've heard that my whole life. But Jesus would say, I'm not finished yet. He says, a new command I give you, love one another, and now he raises the bar as he says, as I have loved you, so you must love one another. So Jesus is leaving soon, and he wants his followers to remember this main thing. As I have loved you, I want you to love one another. Jesus is saying, you are not supposed to love one another the way you love one another. You are to one another the way I want another. Take your cue from me in the way that you love other people. Just picture Jesus as he's talking to Matthew and Nathaniel. Matthew, do you remember that day when we came up to you when you were collecting taxes and Peter wanted to spit on you? But before Peter could spit on you, I asked you to follow me. Do you remember that? I want you to love other people the same way that I loved you that day. And Nathaniel, do you remember what you said about me? Do you remember the very first thing that came out of your mouth about me? You said, can anything good come out of Nazareth? You insulted my whole family and my whole town. Do you remember saying that about me? And do you remember how I responded to you? I invited you to follow me. You need to love one another the way that I have loved you. Verse 35, by this everyone will know you are my disciples if you love one another. Think of the song we sang earlier, Reckless Love. Remember the lyrics of that song? God loved us with a reckless love, and that's the kind of way we're supposed to love other people, where people sit up and take notice. Like, why would you love that person? They don't deserve it. Yeah, they don't deserve it, but God loved me that way. That's why I'm going to love them. It's a reckless love. When people see this unusual kind of love, then they will figure out that you're one of my followers. And this is the only time Jesus said, this is the one thing I want to mark you as a follower. So Simon Peter comes through again. He says, yeah, 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 we got that. But can you tell us now where you're going? And Jesus is thinking, were you even listening to me? I just told you the main thing I want you to remember. But you're more concerned about where I'm going. You know, the problem with religions and Christianity is on this list. The problem is that we have this gravitational pull away from treating people well because we'd rather follow some list of rules. Andy Stanley put it this way. He said, the gravitational pull of religion is always toward rule-keeping rather than relationship building. I think people would rather try to keep a list of rules because they feel more in control that way. It's much easier for me to come up with my own list of rules to follow where I can simply check them off the list and, say, and then say that God and I are in good standing. You know, let's see, I went to church, I read my Bible, I said a prayer, I gave some money to church, so based on all those things I just checked off my list, then God and I should be in good standing for another week or so. But with this list I just created, it's still okay for me to hate you and treat you poorly and gossip about you because I checked all those other good things off my list. Yes, I love God, but there are just certain people I can't stand. You really can't expect me to love those people, can you? It's much easier to check things off a list than it is to love people who are hard to love. So be honest with yourself. You probably have some people who come to your mind right now who are hard to love. It might be a coworker, might be an in-law. You've tried to make a deal with God where you can say, I'm going to try to love those people, but I still want to talk bad about them to other people. You know, we sometimes try to create our own little religion where we follow some rules so that we can say, things with me and God are good, but I still have permission to hate you as long as I love God. You know, Jesus will have no part of that kind of religion. Jesus said the two greatest commandments are loving God and loving others. You can't separate the two. It's sad, but some people have stayed away from churches because they have been mistreated in the name of religion. Jesus died on a cross so that lost people could be saved, so I don't think Jesus is real fond of his followers mistreating the people he died for. 
Again, it's sad to say, but some people have stayed away from the church because they've seen a lack of love in the followers of Christ. One person said, you know, the person I know who knows the most scripture is also the meanest person I know. How can that be? Well, that person with the head full of Bible verses must think that they can check a few things off the list to stay good with God, but it really doesn't matter how you treat other people. Jesus says, I'm not buying it. Verse 35, by this everyone will know you're my disciples if you love one another. So that's what Jesus said. Now, a little more than 20 years after Jesus said this, the Apostle Paul is now a Christian. He's traveling from town to town, starting churches, and after he leaves a church and moves on, the people back at that church do what Christians often do. They develop a list of rules to follow, and then they use their religion as an excuse to mistreat people. So Paul, so in many of the letters that the Apostle Paul sends back to these churches, he tries to teach the people to get back to the basics. The church at Corinth had some problems. They had formed some cliques around human leaders, so Paul confronts them. He devotes a whole chapter of his letter stressing the importance of love to them. People will know you are a follower of Christ if you love one another. And then he does something similar when he writes to the church in Colossae. In this letter, he goes into great detail on what a Christian should wear. And this might make you a little nervous, because he was writing this before the invention of buttons or zippers. Colossians chapter 3, verse 12. As God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Bear with each other and forgive one another if any of you has a grievance against someone. Forgive as the Lord forgave you. And over all these virtues, put on love, which binds them all together in perfect unity. So verse 12, as God's chosen people, clothe yourselves. Paul's telling us what a Christian should wear, and he gives us a real detailed list of what we should put on. Clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. As you look at this list, it's a good time to ask yourself, if you display these things in your life. Don't worry about what other people are wearing. Ask yourself if you are dressed properly. And as we go through this list, I've given a few definitions on your outline. The word translated compassion is a word that implies loving somebody with all your heart. In the Greek culture, this word didn't mean loving somebody with all your heart. It meant loving somebody with all your bowels. You love another person with all your guts. You know what happens if you care about somebody deeply and you get a phone call that has some very bad news about them? Anybody actually got that sick feeling in your stomach from a phone call like that? Maybe you even have to sit down to process the news you just heard. I've had that happen where I've had a really good day and then I get a phone call with some bad news about somebody I care about. And it's just like somebody punched you in the gut. You feel terrible, physically sick. Paul says that as a follower of Christ, you need to have that kind of compassion for other people. You feel for other people and what they are going through. Maybe they screwed up and brought the problem on themselves, but you can still have compassion for them, can't you? Regardless of the fact that they didn't listen to you the first three times you warned them. In your mind, You might try to rationalize why another person doesn't deserve your compassion. You might think things like, well, look at his track record. He's just going to do it again. He never learns. Why should I show her compassion when she's never shown compassion to me? Jesus doesn't want to hear your excuses. Jesus says, if you claim to be my follower, then show compassion to people. Then he says, clothe yourself with kindness. How would you define kindness? If you're going to wear something, we should know how to define it. Kindness is when you loan your strength to someone else. Kindness can mean that somebody, somebody needs something to be done for them, so you go do it for them. You extend yourself. You loan them your strength. Jesus is saying that he wants us to put on this new habit of showing kindness to people. If you're leaving a store and you see a person approaching the store who's using a walker or maybe they're pushing a baby stroller, You can pause and take the time to hold the door. They were going to have to try to navigate the walker or the stroller through the door. 
So you loan them your strength and you hold the door. If you're a follower of Christ, that should become a normal reaction. It becomes a lifestyle. Kindness can be contagious. When somebody does some, some unexpected act of kindness for you, it kind of jogs your memory, and you're more eager to do an act of kindness for somebody else. After kindness, he says we should clothe ourselves with humility. Humility is seeing myself as I really am in relationship to other people and to God. So humility means I view myself accurately. I see myself the same way that God sees me. I'm just like other people. I am a sinner in need of a Savior. There's equality among human beings. The thing that makes you special and the thing that makes me special isn't that you have more money or you have more talent or I have more money or I have more talent. The thing that makes us special is that we are loved by God. That's what makes us special. Humility allows me to approach you as an equal, no matter what you do or what you don't do. It doesn't matter if you're young or old, we are equal in the eyes of God. The ground is level at the foot of the cross. And then he moves on to gentleness. And gentleness is the decision to respond to you in light of your strengths or weakness instead of responding to you out of my strength. You can picture it this way. It's the difference between picking up a contact lens on the end of your finger or picking up a baseball with the palm of your hand. You have the capacity to do both but you're going to adjust your approach depending upon what's needed. And gentleness does the same thing in the way you treat people. You don't say one size fits all when it comes to people. There may be times when you need to gear things down as you deal with another person, because that's simply what gentleness does. And then he comes to patience. That's a decision that you make. Patience is deciding to go the speed of another person. Patience is a gift that you give to another person because you're going to give them the gift of your time. You're willing to say, I'm going to move at your speed instead of mine. You know, if you have an attitude that says, I'm the most important person in the planet, so I don't have time to slow down for other people, if you have that self-centered attitude, then you're seldom going to show patience to people. But if you have humility, and you see yourself the way God sees you, then you're going to be willing to sh slow down and show patience to people. It's interesting that in one of the other letters that he wrote to a different church, Paul wrote, love is patient, love is kind. If you're filled with the love of Christ, then patience and kindness should come naturally. Verse 13, Paul moves to forgiveness. He says, bear with each other and forgive one another. If any of you has a grievance against someone, forgive as the Lord forgave you. So here's a universal truth that we need to remember. Every one of us in this room is going to struggle with forgiving another person at some point in our lives. And when you have this struggle going on in your mind as to whether you should forgive another person, what sorts of thoughts are you going to wrestle with? She doesn't really deserve my forgiveness. She doesn't realize how much she hurt me or my family. Why should I forgive him when he hasn't even asked for forgiveness? We wrestle with thoughts like that. But let me ask this question. What is the standard we should use when deciding how to forgive others? The Apostle Paul gives us the standard in this verse. He says we are to forgive just as the Lord forgave us. So that's really the standard for everything today, isn't it? God was compassionate towards you, so be compassionate to others. Do you remember how many times you made a promise to God? And do you remember how many times you broke that promise? God was patient with you. So you need to be patient with other people. God was gentle and kind with you. So be gentle and kind to other people. And then he wraps this section up with a bow as he brings us back to love. And he's still using that metaphor of putting on clothing as he tells us about the last piece of clothing to wear. Verse 14, over all these virtues put on love, which binds them all together in perfect unity. Love is kind of like an overcoat or a vest that brings everything together. So when you look at everything that we looked at today, some of you might be a little skeptical about how this plays out in real life. You might be thinking, well, you don't know the people at my workplace. How will I ever be productive in life if I'm going to slow down to try to be patient and kind and gentle and forgiving? Well, I think we need to remember the person who gave this teaching. The Apostle Paul accomplished more in a few years 
than most of us will accomplish in a lifetime. Do you realize that? 2,000 years from now, nobody's going to be quoting you or me. But they're still quoting the Apostle Paul. And he's the one who gave us this teaching. The guy who gave us this teaching is a guy who got on a boat that you wouldn't dream of getting on. And he did that to go start churches. He went to some dangerous places. He got stoned. He got beat up. He was shipwrecked. The reason the church spread and the reason we have churches today is because God used this man and his teaching. And remember that Paul did all of this without electricity and Motrin and Tylenol. So when he tells us to put on compassion and gentleness and humility and kindness, I think we should listen to him. People will know that we are followers of Jesus not by what we do on Sunday mornings. They will know we are followers of Jesus by the way we treat other people. So as we apply today's message, let's remember that a lot of what we talked about today is not going to feel natural to you. We live in a world that says, you did this to me, so I'm going to do this to you. If this was natural, then Jesus wouldn't have had to give us this teaching. But Jesus says there's a new standard of love if you're my follower. I want you to love like I've loved you. And I think if the church had a motto, it should be, go love like Jesus loved. Wouldn't that be accurate? Just go love people the way that Jesus did. Let's remember that Jesus didn't come to make a point. I hope you don't think, leave here today thinking that I learned a really good point about love today. Jesus wanted this to become a lifestyle for his followers so that they could have an eternal impact. If Jesus came to simply teach us an important point about love, he could have done that in 15 minutes and gone back to heaven. There would have been no need for him to die on a cross. But Jesus showed up to make an eternal difference, and now he's given that same mission to his followers, the church, and he wants us to make an eternal difference. And it starts with the way that we treat people. And we're going to see a difference in our relationships if we treat people with this. You're going to see improved relationships at home, in the workplace. When people see genuine compassion or an amazing act of kindness that they never expected, they're going to sit up and take notice. So again, let's remember, some people in our culture have given up on the church because of the way that they were treated by people inside the church. And if there's anyone here who has given up on Jesus or given up on the church, then I want to apologize to you for the way that Christians have treated you. And I hope that you won't give up on Jesus just because a few Christians failed to get dressed in the morning. And I hope that you'll encounter some real followers of Jesus who will love you the way that Jesus loves you. Because that's really what the church is supposed to be all about. We're supposed to love people the way Jesus does. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I want to thank you for showing us a reckless love. You've just been so amazing when you reached down to us to love us and save us when we didn't deserve it. So now, Lord, help us to see people through your eyes and to show that same kind of love to others. We just want to celebrate you and your amazing love. And we just want to commit ourselves to love becoming a lifestyle. We know that you can produce that change in us. We're asking you to do that, and we want you to receive the glory as this happens. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.